And according to verse 50, we see in this text this morning that the Bible says when it was all said and done, when it was all over, the Bible says that Jesus was left alone. That, that being said, I, I want to lift, I want to interrogate you and, 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 and bring this query to mind. And the question is in today's text is that how do you remain strong when left alone? How, how, do you, how do you remain strong? How do you keep your head up? How do you keep smiling? How, how do you keep a stiff upper chin? How do, you, how do you get to a place that regardless of what's taking place, People don't know what you're going through because you look the same. How, how do you remain strong when people who promised that they were going to be there for you and be there with you and people who were of the mindset who says, when everybody else leaves, I'll be the one who will be right here. How do you remain strong when you're left alone? Let, let, let's, look at, let's look at the example of Jesus. The first thing I want to give you, how do you remain strong when you're left alone, is that point number one, you, you've got to recognize that some people are conveniently with you. Recognize that some people are conveniently with you. Some people are conveniently with you. Some people are conveniently with you. And when I say some people are conveniently with you, it's important for you to know that anytime you have a relationship that is based upon convenience, that's a relationship with no value. This week we'll be married 30 years and over those 30 years of being together, we've lived in some strange neighborhoods. One of the neighborhoods, matter of fact, not just one, it almost appears that most of the neighborhoods now, glory to God, that we live in, I don't know what it is. I don't know if the people call from another neighborhood and tell the folks in the new neighborhood that we showed up. I don't know what it is, but, but something unique happens in these new neighborhoods and, and, and the unique thing that happens is this, is that oftentimes while we are driving down the road, waving at our neighbors, speaking to our neighbors, bumping the horn at our neighbors, our neighbors oftentimes act like they don't even see us. Maybe that doesn't happen to you. I pray it never does. Amen. And pray my strength in the Lord because, amen, sometimes, sometimes I'm of the place that I am not as spiritual as I should be when that happens. Sometimes I say to myself, it's a blessing you wasn't in the street while I was. Uh, pray, yeah, yeah, yeah. P pray my strength. Pray my strength. Yeah, pray my strength in the Lord. Glory to God. But, but, but here it is, here it is, here it is. What, what oftentimes what oftentimes takes me back or, 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 or catches me off guard is that the same people that I'm waving and I'm speaking to and I'm bumping the horn who act like they don't see me when they get ready to go out of town, they come across the street, ring the doorbell and ask would I go pick up their mail while they are gone. They ask would I watch the house. They ask, oh God, they ask would I, would I come and, and take the newspaper away. And I'm of the mindset, wait a minute, I've never said it and I know that the Lord is a keeper, but sometimes I've been wanting to say, wait a minute, you don't, sp you don't speak to me. Wait a minute, I didn't know you knew that I exist. Lord, give me strength here today. Sometimes our biggest inconvenience is as a result of the fact we have allowed people to come into our lives at their convenience. Uh, let me say it again. I said, one of, one of your biggest headaches, one of your biggest problems, one of your biggest situations is that you have opened the door for people to come in your life only at a time, only at a place, only at a point when it's most convenient for them and when you are no longer convenient or when they no longer need you, it means this, then your value all of a sudden is gone and anytime your value is found in convenience, it means this, you don't have value at all. Oh, let me go here. Something is wrong, Lord have mercy. I'd rather be alone to find out that the only reason why you wanted to date me is that you couldn't get a date from nowhere else. I would rather be of the mindset just, uh, y'all not hearing me, just, yeah, yeah, now you want to talk to me because the girl has dropped you or because the boy won't return your phone call. So understand this, I don't want to be a part of default relationships because anytime you are part of a default relationship you don't have a real relationship at all what are you saying what are you saying what I'm saying is this is that what got Jesus through this difficult moment of his life is this is that there was something that he recognized he recognized that some people are only conveniently 
with you. Listen to the text, verse 48. It says, and Jesus said to them, he says, have you come out as against a robber? Listen to this. With swords, listen to this, with clubs, glory to God, to capture me. Do you see it? See, understand this. People who are built for your uh, some, some people who come around you to enjoy your pleasures are not built to deal with your pain. And that's why you have to qualify the people that you have in your, in your life because everybody that shows up around you, everyone loves a rising star, but very few people will stay hooked to a falling star. Jesus recognized this, Jesus recognized this, Jesus recognized this is that the disciples to a degree were only around him due to his convenience. They was all right as long as he was turning water into wine. They were all right as long as he was unstopping deaf ears. They were all right as long as he was giving sight to the blind. But now he is at a place that he is in the garden of Gethsemane and check this out, and no one can be found. And glory to God, what empowered him to stand and by himself was this is that listen Jesus put more faith and more trust in his father than he did his friends I don't know who this is for but whatever you're going through this morning maybe God is trying to show you something and the thing that God is trying to show you is that now it's time for you to shift your attention You've been placing all of your trust in your friends. You've been placing all of your trust in your money. Mm, some of you have been placing all of your trust in your mama. And I stopped by to tell you that mama, friends, and family will let you down. But there is one, glory to God, who will never let you down. He will never abandon you. He will never forsake you. He knows how to keep a secret. He can keep you wrapped up, tied up, tangled up in the palm of his hand. And the devil in hell can can't do you any harm when Jesus is strong in your life. What are you saying, Pastor? This is what I'm saying is that, listen, sometimes as we go through certain situations, we have to be of the mindset that we recognize that some people are only with us conveniently. Now, now I want to move to the next point, but, but, but one of the things that, that I want you to know is that Jesus is not into default relationships. No, 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 no. Jesus, yeah, you in trouble now. Yeah, you don't know what tomorrow's going to bring. Yeah, you behind on something. Yeah, you got to go to court. Yeah, on and so forth. They've already put the notice on the door. And now all of a sudden, you've gotten real spiritual. I want you to know that before the notice was on the door, you should have been spiritual. I want you to know that before they sent you the subpoena, you should have had a, a meaningful, tangible relationship with God. Stop putting more faith in things and in people more than you do God himself. According to the text, the first thing we see, how does he remain strong? How does he remain strong? How does he remain strong? First of all, he remains strong because he recognized that, listen, that, that some of them are only with him according to their convenience. Oh, Lord, give me strength. Some years ago, I had the opportunity to do I had the opportunity to do some, some marriage counseling to a couple, and as we were doing the marriage counseling, uh, you know, a lot of things come out in premarital counseling. A lot of things come out in marriage counseling. And that's why you ought to go to get it out, amen? And, and so as we were doing the premarital counseling, the young man said, well, pastor, I have a problem with her. I said, well, what's the problem? He said, the problem is she went back home. She went back home to see her. She went back home to see her, her daughter's father. I said, well, is that right? I said, well, dear, why did you go home to see, why did you go home to see your daughter's father? She said, because I wanted to see if anything was left there before I moved forward in the marriage. Now, I couldn't have just sat there. I couldn't have. Now, when people tell you I'm with you for the rebound, I wish I had some help here. I, I wish I had some help. When, when they tell you the only reason I'm dating you because he won't date me or because he won't, that means that is a default relationship. I'm with you by default, not as a result of devotion. And I want you to know that this is a time when you're standing all by yourself. God cannot be a default God. Jesus can't be a default Savior. The Holy Ghost can't be your default keeper. Either he is or he is not. Either he is there or he is not. Either you are seeking him or you are not.
Well, we finally made it to God be the praise and the glory, great and mighty things, my God, he has done. I want to welcome you to Hopewell uh, St. John's. We're so glad that you decided to worship with us today, and it's our prayer that it won't be your last time. I want you to know that Hopewell is one church in two locations. Our mother church is uh, in Mandarin, 3990 Loretta Road, and uh, our services will have two services every Sunday. One service at our Mandarin campus, 3990 Loretta Road, from 9.15 a.m. to 10.45 a.m. And then here at Hopewell St. John's from 11.15 a.m. to 12.45 p.m. Listen, let me tell you just a little bit about what you can expect here at Hopewell St. John's. Now, over the next couple of weeks, we'll be introducing starting something here, we already do it at our Mandarin campus called our life groups and our small groups. Now, some of you who came from traditional churches, you know that uh, you call it Sunday school. You know, we call ours life groups. And the reason why we call ours life groups is because uh, the life groups actually give life. Great bonds are made and established. Great relationships are made. People study the Word of God. Lifelong relationships are met as a result of our, our life group. So we'll be telling you the times and the starts of that. We also do small groups. And small groups, uh, sometimes they meet at our Mandarin campus or they meet at Panera's and various places such as that. And so on Tuesdays and Thursdays, we plan to do our small groups here. You'll break up in literal small groups, about 12, maybe 13 people, no more than that because we want... We try to keep a, that's how we keep a large church small, keep it intimate. And then our life groups will convene on Sunday morning. So we'll be telling you a little bit about that. For those of you who are 18 to 22, uh, you know, you're just graduated high school into that college mode on and so forth. We have something what we call 1822. And uh, we're going to start that over the next couple of weeks. My son, Gary Jr., great worship leader here, he'll uh, be leading that up. But while we're in the main house, you guys will be in the cafe, I mean, with your lattes and your espressos, uh, and you all will be studying the Word of God and worshiping and having a good time there. So we'll, we'll, be, do we'll be doing that for you guys. Uh, we're a church who believes in Holy Communion. Holy Communion will take place every first Sunday at 3 p.m., and it will be at our Mandarin campus. Uh, we have a lot of exciting things coming down the pipe. Next year, we're going to be focused on the uh, athletic field to bring people in. Our conference center, we have a place that we're also going to build called the Hangout. That's just for young folks. So there are a lot of exciting things that are happening here at Hopewell Church. But what I want to leave you with is this. If you do not know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord of your life, it's my prayer that by the end of today's message that you will give your life to him. Because with Christ, we live. Through him, we live, move, and have our being. And there is no life without eternal life. And you only find that in Jesus Christ. Welcome to Hopewell Church. Hold on for the ride. It's going to be an exciting time. God bless. Yeah, according to the text, the challenge, the problem in the text was this, is that how did he remain strong being left alone? First of all, he recognized some people are are conveniently with you. Look, look at verse 49, verse 49, day after day. Matter of fact, go back to verse 48 because I want to show you something. And Jesus said to them, have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Do you see that? Look, look at 49. Day after day, I was with you in the temple teaching and you did not seize me. But listen to what Jesus says on the end of that. But let the scriptures, glory to God, be fulfilled. How, 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 do you stand, how do you stand strong when you're left alone? The second way you do it is this, is that you've got to determine that God will be glorified and not mocked. You've got to determine that God is going to be glorified, great God Almighty. God is going to be glorified and not. How does he stand? How does he stand in the midst of glory to God, of, of looking at his enemies, looking his enemies in the face. The disciples are asleep. Now notice because Jesus is dealing, glory to God, with two different crews. The first crew followed him in Gethsemane and they are asleep. Are you with me? The second crew comes to arrest him at Gethsemane. Are you listening to me? First crew come, he, he takes them into Gethsemane. 
And as he takes them and brings them in Gethsemane with him, he had asked them in Matthew 26, 36 through 46, can you watch and pray with me? And then he asked them this, will you watch with me one hour? And the Bible says he goes off, prays the same prayer on three different occasions. And check this out, on three different occasions, he comes back and they are asleep every single time. Now, 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 here it is, here it is, here it is. A and then the Bible says something when you start reading Matthew 26, 36 through 46. The Bible says that as he entered and as he went into the Garden of Gethsemane, this is what he says. My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, check this out, even unto death. Wow, which means this, when he went in the garden, he was messed up. When he went in the garden, the Bible says this, that he prays three different times. And I know that there are people who will oftentimes tell you, just ask God one time and that's it. Well, that's not what Jesus did in Matthew 26, 36 through 46. The Bible says that he prays on three different occasions. Check this out. And he says the same prayer three different, three different times. But, but understand this. Why, as, he, as he is in the garden, as he is praying, the Bible says that he prays the, the problem of his situation is so intense until the Bible says this, that when Jesus, as he prayed, the Bible says he starts sweating. You've got to read the text. And it says that he began to sweat so profusely, the Bible says, until sweat came down like great drops of blood. Are you listening to me? Now, what you see in Matthew 26, 36 through 46, is you see an agonizing Jesus. Are you listening to me? Jesus is agonizing. You not only see an agonizing Jesus, you see a questioning Jesus. You, you see a troubled Jesus. Why do you see that? Because the Bible says that when he looked in the cup, he says that, Father, if it be possible, remove this bitter cup. He goes on to say this, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. In, 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 in Matthew 26, 36 through 46, there is an agonizing Jesus, an agonizing Savior. But when you come to Mark chapter 14, verse 48, don't look like Jesus agonizing anymore. Doesn't look, like, doesn't look like Jesus is confused about what's going on. Go, go back to verse 48. Listen to him talk now. He's, this is not the same Jesus that first got to Gethsemane that's now confronting those who've come to Gethsemane. Are you listening to him? It's not the same Jesus. Because when you look at verse 48, Jesus, listen to how he talks and communes and communicate, or not commune, but communicate with those who come to arrest him. He says in 48, Jesus said to them, have you come out against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? In other words, now, he, he, he gave them a little word. He, he, he chided them right there. Look at verse 49, day after day, I was with you in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me. Watch this, watch this. Then listen to what he says as he, as he goes on. But let the scripture be fulfilled. My God, this is what you got to see. See, how you respond in certain things determine how you respond to certain things. How you respond in certain things determine how you respond to certain things. What, what are you saying? What are you saying? See, how he responds to his heavenly father in Gethsemane determine how he responded to those who came to arrest him at Gethsemane. Uh, uh, they sleep, maybe it's a new church, I don't know what it is. But, 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 but this is what I'm saying. Everybody is going to have a Gethsemane. Gethsemane is, is the sacrifice that you have to make, but you recognize it's a sacrifice that calls you to go beyond the call of duty. And I don't know, I don't know if you are there, I don't know if you've been there, and if you have not been there, the time will come when you will go there that, that every, each and every one of us will be faced with a Gethsemane. There are times in life, glory to God, when you won't choose things, but things will choose you. There are times in life when you won't choose the issue, the issue will choose you. I stopped by to tell you, somebody perhaps in here is battling cancer. You didn't choose cancer, but cancer chose you. 
Somebody got to go to court this week, next week, the week after next. You didn't choose that. Check this out. It chose you. You didn't choose divorce. Divorce chose you. You didn't choose for your child to end up in jail, but the situation chose you. And here is the $64,000 question that when life chooses you, the question is how are you going to not only react, but better than that, how are you going to respond? And I stopped by to tell you that when you go through your Gethsemane, you ought to be of the mindset that I got a made up mind that regardless of what happens, I'm going to glorify God and not mock him. I, I wish I had some help here. That you, you got a made up mind. You got a made up mind. You got a made up mind that you're going to glorify God. You're going to glorify God. Oh God. See, see the reason why he could talk the way he talked in verse 48 and 49 was based upon what happened while he was in Gethsemane. And that means this, you got to stop, begin to start talking more to your father and less to your friends. That doesn't mean you ought not have any friends. But the problem is, is that sometimes when we are left alone, we crumble to pieces. And here's the reason why. Because we have put our friends in the place of God. And I want you to know that God is not to be mocked. He is to always be number one in your life. Are you listening to me? You ought to be of the mindset, what, how, what, what got him through? What, what got Jesus through? What got Jesus through Gethsemane was the fact he was determined that he was going to glorify God. And not mock him. I, I stopped by to say, and, and notice, notice, notice in Gethsemane, he's agonizing. When they come to take him and arrest him, he has an anchor. Notice the perseverance in Gethsemane allowed him to deal with the pain once they came to arrest him. Why is that? Because Gethsemane has to count for something. What are you saying, Pastor? Church got to count for something. Church got to count for something. We, we can't, no, 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 no. All this money we have spent to put these buildings up and to do all this stuff. This, no, 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 no. This is not, I want you to know, this is not, this wasn't just an exercise for me. It wasn't just something just to see if we could do something and figure it out. This got to count for something. Church has to count for something. Worship. See, the reason why I come to church is not only to get the word, but to also to get the worship. I, the praise team and the choir sing because for me, church has to count for something. I, I just don't believe that I need a, 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 a mental exercise and just reading the Bible and not knowing what I read and can't remember a verse or can't remember a scripture and I'm misquoting scripture and when people misquote scripture, I agree with what they misquoted because I don't know this. Uh, 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 uh. Life is too serious. Life is too difficult. Life is too arduous. There's too much pain in life. There's too much problems in life. There's too much death in life. There's too much sickness in life for me to merely come to church and just go through the motion because I don't have anything else to do. Oh, somebody could be playing golf right now. Somebody could be at the town center right now. Somebody could be at the beach right now. Somebody could be at a picnic right now. It just doesn't make sense to be up in this house and not get a living word for your dying soul. It just don't make sense to, to dress up and put all these lights and cameras up here and then I leave the same way I, I left. I leave defeated. I leave depressed. I leave confused. What are you saying, Pastor? What I'm saying is this, is that for me, church got to count for something. I mean, when I come in here, it has to count for something. It has to have some type of meaning. Got to have some type of essence. And let me tell you this, anytime worship can be used for warfare, it means your worship is now worthless. The reason why I come to church is because I need God to feed me with the bread from heaven. The reason I come to church is because I need to take a drink from the crystal fountain. I need to take a drink from the well that never runs dry. I know I got demons I got to face this week. I know I got issues I got to deal with this week. And I recognize that I can't deal with it in my own flesh. So I need to be built up in my most holy faith. I need him to speak to me. I need him to show the foundation beneath my feet. And I recognize that when I stand on his word, I stand on his word because I know that all other ground is nothing but sinking sand. What are you saying, church? got to count for something. 
you ought not be able to get to some of the songs because you're not just going through a ritual. You got a relationship. And when you got a relationship, things happen. When you have a relationship, God begins to move. I stop by to tell you that when you pray, it ought to be more than just rehearse words. You ought to feel the presence of God in the prayer. What are you saying? Your worship got to count for something. Because if your worship is not counting for anything, you have wasted your time. And the problem is, the problem is, the reason why we can't stand alone is because we've been standing on stuff that wouldn't hold us up in the first place. I wish I had some help. I wish I had some help. You want to know why you can't deal with it because your trust is in the wrong person. You want to know why you can't go through it. You want to know why you feel the way that you feel. You feel that way. And could it be that God is shifting your attention? He's trying to shake some things in your life to let you know that at the end of the day and at the most difficult time in your life, the only thing that's going to stand is the word of the living God. Can I tell you something? The person that you talk most to is the person who knows more about you. Think about it. Think about it. Some of us got friends. Some of us talk to our parents. Some of us talk to our children every day. And there's, there's nothing wrong with that. But something is wrong when you will talk to your earthly father. Something is wrong when you will talk more to your earthly mother. Something is wrong when you talk to your earthly friend more than you do your heavenly father. It was not Jesus' friends that got him through Gethsemane. It was his father that got him through Gethsemane. Hi, my name is Maxine Williams. And I'm Gary Williams, senior pastor of Hopewell Church. We'd like to invite you to come out and join us here at Hopewell Church. Listen, we're one church in two locations. You can join us on Sundays at our Mandarin campus from 9.15 a.m to 10.45 a.m. or right here at our St. John's campus on Sundays at 11.15 to 12.45 p.m. Log on to our website, joinhopewell.com. Thanks for watching. To order this or any other messages, log on to joinhopewell.com or connect with us at 268-2422.